Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we are present before you again to hear your word. And we pray that the words we hear will profit us in Jesus' name. We pray that the error of the people of our generation will not be part of our lives in Jesus' name. Direct us and lead us by your word. That everything we do will be according to the word of God. And will be acceptable in your sight as a holy sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. We are continuing our studies of the Acts of the Apostles. Very deep studies and very beneficial for the church that is interested in patterning everything that is done according to the direction of the Holy Ghost and according to the sacred record of the history of the early church. And the chapter we are reading today is very, very instructive and very important for every church and for our church in particular. Any church that patterns itself according to the word of God and according to the pattern of the early church will see a lot of things very similar to the early church. In the early church, there was a spirit of evangelism reaching out in the power of the Holy Ghost and they had great results of winning souls. And in this church, we have seen that spirit of evangelism filling us with compassion and love and mercy wanting to reach out wanting to tell people until the whole world will know in the early church the Holy Ghost so moved in his power that signs miracles and wonders follow in this church we have seen that as we have yielded ourselves to the Holy Ghost signs wonders miracles have also followed us in the early church, the Holy Ghost directed that the preaching of the gospel will not only be in Jerusalem, will not only be in Judea, or just the places where you had the Jewish settlements. But they went to the regions beyond. And the Holy Ghost directed that Paul and Barnabas will go to the places that he had outlined for them in the gentle cities and preach the gospel. In this church, we have found the same thing. That the Holy Ghost has moved us, directed us, controlled us, and he has given us opportunities to preach the gospel. Not only here where this deeper life started and took root, but all over Nigeria and in many countries in Africa and also in places outside Africa. In the early church, they fellowshiped around the word of God. Their fellowship was not just around their sentiments, their feelings, their emotions, personal matters, cultures, traditions. In the early church, the emphasis in their fellowship was in the word of God. Because from the very day the Holy Ghost was poured out upon the believers, the Bible says they all continued in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. All the time in the early church, doctrine and fellowship went together. Wherever they were fellowshipping together, they were also emphasizing the doctrines of the Bible. And wherever there were no doctrines of the Bible, there was New Testament fellowship completely absent. And in this church also we have found the same thing. That as we have come around, come together as people of God, we have emphasized the doctrines of the Bible. We have also emphasized fellowship within the framework of the doctrines of the Bible. We do not separate doctrine and fellowship. We do not separate teaching and worship. We have gone the New Testament way and we have said, where there is the worship of God, there is the submission to the word of God. Where there is fellowship of the believers, there is the teaching of the doctrines of the Bible. And it, it's just like it was in the early church, in every church today that is named Deeper Life Bible Church. Having any connection, any relationship with this uh, headquarters church here in Lagos, we have emphasized that the doctrine and the fellowship will go on at the same time. We have also warned our people 
in Lagos at the headquarters and everywhere we have had branches of the word of God just like they did in the New Testament that anywhere the doctrine of the Bible is trampled upon rejected not accepted refused and they will not live by the doctrine of the word of God we have told all believers that are associated with Deep Alive Bible Church they must not also have fellowship because it was that strong in the early church that where the doctrine was missing the true New Testament believer withdrew his fellowship of course that attitude in the New Testament wasn't appreciated by the religious freaks the religious professionals the religious people of the day they said have fellowship with us only make sure that you are not teaching in this name or by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to which Peter the Apostle was very very quick very very sharp to reply we cannot but speak you hear that the Word of God we cannot but speak the things we have known the things we have seen they were persecuted they were imprisoned but you remember that in one of the occasions when they were imprisoned the angel of God was sent from heaven and he told Peter and the colleague that was put in the prison he said go back to that same temple and preach this word of life and so in the New Testament the word was very well emphasized but then it so happened at the New Testament time that there were some people that didn't stay long enough to learn. They were saved. They were born again. They were children of God. They came into the fellowship of the children of God to fellowship. But they did not spend enough time to learn from the word of God. And without anybody sending them out from the headquarters church in Jerusalem, without being appointed and anointed by the Holy Ghost in the church at Antioch, they started following the trails of Barnabas and Paul in the first missionary journey. Everywhere that Paul had gone, everywhere that Barnabas had gone, they also started going to those places, teaching and preaching and trying to minister now if they are taught the truth their mistake of being of going out without being sent might have been pardonable but they taught error and Paul the apostle had such a difficult time not sharing fellowship with them Paul and Barnabas called them. They didn't call them for fellowship and worship and singing and praising the Lord and clapping hands and sharing testimonies. No. When somebody is in error, you don't call him for fellowship, for clapping, for singing, for worshiping. You call him for a serious business to settle the doctrinal dispute. And he called them. And he said, these things we're hearing, the teaching that you are projecting, the things that you are telling the people, all the places the church had been established, they are wrong. They are not according to the teaching of the Holy Ghost in the, new in the new covenant and the new dispensation. How about it? Will you change? Will you repent? Oh, they said no. Eventually, when Paul and Barnabas could not handle the people, all the churches that were being troubled by the harassment of the false presentation of the doctrine they had to come to the headquarters church in Jerusalem and that is the very issue that Acts of the Apostles chapter 15 dealt with and thank God that even in the New Testament you can see these individuals and these cases of people that have not been well taught people that are not matured enough bringing strange spurious 
erroneous doctrines into the church. But the Bible makes it very clear as to what the church ought to do when false doctrine is trying to enter. And at such a time, when false doctrine is to be dealt with, the emphasis is not love. The emphasis is not fellowship. The emphasis is not worship. The emphasis is not tolerance. When false doctrine is coming in, the emphasis is C. How possible to settle that doctrinal difficulty immediately. You do not sleep over it. You do not wait until a convenient time. You mustn't continue in fellowship that is not recognized by God when false doctrine is coming in. You must forget about that and immediately handle that serious problem of the entrance of false doctrine into the church. And that they did. And thank God in this church, that is what we always do. Well, there are people that may love God, born again, children of God, members of our church. But because they have not waited stayed under teaching long enough they can get into a mistake here in teaching a mistake here in doctrine when we hear we don't throw them away we don't tell them not to come to church again we invite them we discuss with them if it happens in a stage the state representative will call the people, iron it out with them. If they accept, that's all. They are already restored into fellowship, worship, and participation of in the work of God. If it happens in a country where we have deeper life, a country in West Africa or East Africa or in Britain or America, and there is an individual that will not submit to the word of God because of immaturity, because of lack of teaching. That individual is called by our national overseer in that country. And he said, try. And he says, brother or sister, this doctrine you are bringing is not according to the word of God. Or we'll sit him down, sit her down. Teach the individual the word of God. If that individual accepts and owns up, his error, his false doctrine. And he says, oh, I'm very sorry. I did it ignorantly in unbelief, out of lack of teaching. I didn't mean to do evil. I'm so very sorry about it. In fact, I'm ready to go to our local church where I taught that error and make a correction. It's settled. That brother is sincere. That brother is deeply spiritual. It's only that he made a mistake. And he's willing to correct that mistake. He is still in fellowship. And he's still going to have the backing of the church from the headquarters here all through to all our churches. But if that brother or sister in Nigeria here, or in West Africa, or in East Africa, or any part of the world where we have deeper life Bible church will say no. I got that thing in a dream. I got it in a vision. And I cannot change it. I know that well the Bible says this but that angel in the dream told me this. And that thing that this man is maintaining is contrary to the word of God. And he rejects the correction of the national overseer in his country of deeper life or rejects the correction of the state representative of deeper life in the state. Well, the national overseer or the state representative in Nigeria will report to the headquarters church here in Lagos according to the word of God, which I'll read to you now. We'll call the individuals and we'll tell them, this is what we're hearing about you. If that individual will say, yes, that is true, well, if we begin to say now, brother or sister, 
you happen to be wrong. And I will sit down and spend time, hours with that individual. Going from passage of the Bible to the passage of the Bible. If that brother will say, oh, I'm sorry. They corrected me in my country. They corrected me in my state, but I wasn't convinced because that thing that that angel told me in my dream was too strong on me. But now I've seen it. I'm very sorry. Well, we say, all right, that's all right. Anybody can make a mistake. Anybody can go into error if he's not careful. But since you have accepted, it's no problem anymore. Go back to your country and be submissive to the national overseer there. But if the person will not accept, that's another thing. But thank God, the Bible has given us what to do. The Bible, the Lord has not left us alone when you are correcting somebody of a doctrinal error. The Bible has not left the general superintendent of deeper life alone to say, well, I'll pray about it. No, the word of God is there. God has already directed us in the whole of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, what to do? In Genesis, we're told that light and darkness will not mix. That God at the very first day separated light from darkness. And that's an instruction. That if eventually, with all the discussion and all the help and everything, that this person will hold on to error, which is darkness. Well, the Lord has directed the church right from Genesis. We're going to separate that darkness from the light. On you go to the revelation that says if anybody will take away from the word of God, I will take his name out of the book of life. That's the direction to the church that when somebody has gone against the word of God and is taking away a major doctrine of the Bible and you correct him and he will not accept, the Bible makes it very clear you remove that person out of fellowship. If God is going to remove him out of the book of life, that's an instruction to the church. It's removed out of the church. Or if he adds something to the word of God and he says, well, in my dream or in my vision or an angel spoke to me and he adds an error into the word of God, you correct him, you challenge him, you motivate him, you plead with him, you tell him the consequence of what that error will bring. And he says, no, I'm sorry. I regard that angel more than the Bible. I regard that dream more than the authoritative word of God. I take that inspiration I got more than the inspiration of the apostles in the Bible. Well, we have no alternative. That individual who will adamantly, resolutely remain with false doctrine, the church has no alternative to say, well, we're well, sorry. Fellowship cannot continue with you if you are going to hold on to false doctrine. Well, it's a serious matter whenever it happens. It doesn't always happen. In the New Testament, it, it didn't always happen. But once in a while, it happened. And whenever it happened in the New Testament, the church dealt with it very seriously. But tonight, thank God, it is study. So that if you, as a Christian worker, you as a Christian believer... You have been going into the wrong direction. Either you are in the headquarters church here, or you are from deeper life in any state in Nigeria, or you are from deeper life in a West African country or any country. Now, this is the teaching of the Word of God. We take the Word of God, we repent, we say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm going to remain on the teaching of the Word of God. Fine, you remain in fellowship. But you say, no, I'm sorry. You throw away the Bible. You say, no, I don't want the doctrine of the Word of God. There is no fellowship with the Father, with the Son. Neither would you be able to have fellowship with the church that is standing on the Bible when you don't want to stand on the Bible. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. Acts, chapter 15. Verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and to the elders about this question. 
and being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, the headquarters church, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Here was the dissension exposed. As I told you, and as you know already, that Paul and Barnabas were appointed by the Holy Ghost. They had been sent to preach the gospel in many cities outside the country of the headquarters church. Outside Palestine, outside the habitation of the children of Israel. As a result, many Gentiles had been saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that they were saved, many miracles had been performed in all the Gentile cities where they went through the name of Jesus. Not only that, the church, that means a congregation of true believers, was established in every city. As they established each church in every city, elders were ordained, workers were appointed in every church to continue the preaching of the full gospel and the evangelization of their communities. As we have read now, together with me in Acts chapter 15 verses 1 and 2, after Paul and Barnabas left and they came back to Antioch, false teachers arose to preach false doctrines of salvation through the law and through circumcision. These false teachers needed correction. That was the issue that they brought to the Jerusalem church, the headquarters church. Now, when we speak about false teachers, many times there are those who do not understand what the New Testament means by false teacher. You think a false teacher is somebody who has never been saved. Somebody who has never been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody who does not know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. Oh, and we say, run away from false teachers because he's not born again. You know, in this passage we're reading, these false teachers, they were born again. Now look at verse 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. They were Pharisees before. They were in the sect, in the group of religious people before. But then they heard the message of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And they believed. When they believed, they became part of the church. But the unfortunate thing with them is that the ideas of the Pharisees they had before, the tradition of the elders among the Pharisees they had been taught before, they still held on to everything. And even though they were now born again, they believed they were children of God and they came to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ideas they got before from the Pharisees, those ideas were still with them. And so they started going about to project the ideas of the Pharisees. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, but they said, Jesus Christ was not sufficient. It's Jesus and Moses. It's the New Testament doctrine and circumcision. It is the new covenant, the new dispensation, and the rituals. And because they were mixing everything together like that, the word and the tradition, the true doctrine and the culture, the teaching of the word of God and uh, the Mosaic institution, they said everything must go together. 
before these Gentiles will be fully saved. It became false doctrine. Listen to me. A false teacher may be born again. A false teacher may believe that we can be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he adds something to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not sufficient for him. The blood of Jesus Christ is not sufficient for him. He must add something. The blood of Jesus will not be efficacious for him. He must add water. The garment of righteousness is not sufficient. He must add another thing. And the message of the Bible will not be sufficient. He believes it. He believes the Bible, but he also believes the message from the angel must be added. Now you see, that is a false teacher who will not be satisfied with Jesus and Jesus alone. Turn to the back of your sheet. Jesus only is our message. Is the beginning, is the ending, is the alpha, is the omega. Jesus, all our theme shall be. It's not Jesus and something else. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. We will lift him up ever. Jesus only will we see. Jesus only is our savior. It's not Jesus and psychology. It is not Jesus and traditional religion. It is not Jesus and um, animal sacrifice. It is not Jesus and the burning of candle. It is Jesus only that is our savior. All our guilt he bore away. All our righteousness he gives us. All our strength from day to day. Jesus is our sanctifier. It is not Jesus and an angel trying to sanctify us in a dream. It is not Jesus and the founder of a church trying to cleanse us, washing us by the riverside to take all our sins away. It is Jesus only that is our sanctifier, cleansing us from self and sin. And with all his spirit's fullness, filling all our hearts within. It is Jesus only that is our savior. It is not Jesus and the six and seven books of Moses. It is not Jesus and magical power. It is not Jesus and the drinking olive oil. It is not Jesus and another thing. Jesus only is our healer. All our sicknesses he bear. And his risen life and fullness all his members may share. Jesus only is our power. We do not go to the mountainside and be shaking, asking for the dove to come. We stay where we are because Jesus Christ, who is a baptizer in the Holy Ghost, he can baptize you right where you are without going to the riverside, without going to the forest, without going to the mountain top. Jesus only is our power. He is the gift of Pentecost. Jesus breathes thy power upon us, fill us with the Holy Ghost. And for Jesus, we are waiting. For Jesus, we are waiting. We believe that Jesus came before his coming again. Because they same Jesus, whom you have seen going up into heaven, he shall so come in like manner as you have seen him received into heaven. And we are waiting for him. We are not waiting for an angel. We are not waiting for a man. We are not waiting for another person to be born in any part of Nigeria or any part of West Africa to say that now he has come. There are many people today who say they are Jesus. They have come back eating rice and gari with us here. They have not raptured the saints away. And they say, you know, they have come. They are getting married, many wives, having children. And they say they are Jesus. This world is totally in ignorance. But they same Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, born by Virgin Mary, the Jesus of the Bible, who at the age of 12 went to those doctors of the law and he confounded every one of them. That same Jesus of the Bible that went to the cross and he died and he said, it is finished. That same Jesus that rose up on the third day and the grave could not hold him. And all the, the angel came and rolled away the stone. And when the disciples went there to look for him, they said, he is not here. He is not here. Because he's risen from the dead. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? That's the Jesus we're waiting for. 
that Jesus had stayed with his disciples all those days and he showed them by many infallible proofs that he has risen from the dead. The Jesus that went up to heaven that is at the right hand of the Father and is saying, I will come again. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you and I go to prepare a place for you. When I finish, I will come back and I will take you to myself. That's the Jesus I'm waiting for. I believe that's the Jesus we are waiting for. And for Jesus we are waiting, listening for the trumpet sound. And then, and then, it will be us and Jesus living ever with our God. Preach this Jesus. Stand on the word of the Lord. Do not deviate to the right or deviate to the left. Whatever may be happening with people around you, you take your stand and say, Jesus only is our message. If anybody tries to come and confuse you, you say no. I'm holding on to this word. And you as a child of God, contend earnestly for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Will you do it? Will you do it? Rise up and tell the Lord you are going to stand by the word of God. You are going to stand by the word of God. As a preacher in this church, as a worker in this church, as a member in this church, you are going to stand by the word of God. Jesus only and Jesus ever. Jesus only and Jesus ever. Jesus all in all we sing. His savior, his sanctifier, his healer, his baptizer, and is a coming king.